Next, which is dilution, should be 15. So these dilutions, almost every one of these problems, there is two tanks. So I'll just write down what every problem is going to have in it. There'll be two tanks of water, which we'll write as rectangles. Uh, some of these problems, that one tank might be infinite, like maybe uh, one tank's draining out to uh, the ocean or some some other place that we're not keeping track of the concentration anymore and other times there could be like fresh water or some salt water pouring in not uh, and if it was pouring in from the ocean yes the ocean has a finite amount of water but in these problems we assume the ocean's infinite so we're not changing the concentration in the ocean by pulling something out so sometimes one of these two tanks is infinitely large is that like something that it's like useful also like in chemistry because I know sometimes they have to be like that. Oh, it's definitely useful in chemistry, yeah. Usually in chemistry they just, um, I don't know what they do, they just kind of run the experiment and see what happens and then... Um, I'm not sure. It's been a long time since I took chemistry. But you basically do but these the things in practice, that. yeah. Oh, okay. So you're watching the kind of effects of these things happening, whether it's a color change, or I don't know. It's been a long time since yeah. I took chemistry. Particulate, what is it? Particulate matter filters out or something like that. In my experience, things exploded, which is why I stopped taking chemistry. <laughs> I guess that's when it gets fun. So we're gonna have uh, water going potentially two ways from one tank to the other and from the other back to the one so we'll call the tanks one and two and there'll be some rate and some other rate right here sometimes they're equal if they're equal the volumes don't change if they're not equal obviously one tank's going to get more full the other tank will get less full and then we're going to look for uh, usually uh, concentration of one maybe salt or some other chemical in one or both of the tanks. So you know some volume and some concentration. So those are base, and of course I wrote volume twice. They won't have the same volume. I wrote rate twice. They won't be necessarily the same rate, and the concentrations generally won't be the same. So even though I wrote the same word, I mean there'll be a different rate, different volume, different concentration. So this is basically every problem in this section is going to work like this. So let's start giving uh, some names here. We'll go with uh, a one equals amount in tank one. Now when I wrote amount, maybe that's a concentration, maybe that's a total amount by maybe mass or some other way to measure. So maybe 10 pounds of salt, it may be 10 pounds per uh, liter, oh, so that's probably a lot of salt, 10 pounds per, all right, 10 ounces per, <laughs> per gallon of water, something like that. So it could be given as concentration or it could be given as absolute amount. So that's why I just wrote amount right there. Uh, so A2 will be amount in tank 2. And then we want to look at how the amount is going to change over time. So assuming it's a closed system and the volumes are not infinite, we can, uh, we have this assumption. What can you say if it's a closed system and there's no leaks? What can you say about uh, A1 plus A2? The equal constant. It'll be a constant. So if there's like leaking out, we're not losing any amount of our material. So I'll just write equal C for constant. So this is basically what our differential equation is going to look like. Oh, this doesn't have any derivatives in it. Uh, let's start thinking about derivatives. 
So I'm writing A1 prime now. So this tells us how the amount in uh, the tank is changing. Now <clears throat> I need two different rates. So let's call it uh, I'll just call it rate one and two. And so rate one will be uh, leaving tank one. So we got A1 and A2. All right, so A1 prime. The way we get A1 prime, this is how the amount's changing. So what we're going to do is basically figure out how much is leaving and how much is uh, arriving. So we're going to go um, in minus out. And that basically works kind of like big minus small. We're going to go in minus out. So in, what rate is going in, one or two? So rate two is going in. So we're going to get R2. Now, <clears throat> it's R2 times A2 because what is going through that, uh, wh what type of material is coming through with rate 2, it's the material is whatever the concentration in A2 is. That's what's flowing through. So that's what's going in. And out uses R1. Oops, R1. And the, yeah, it'll be R1, A1. These are, mul these are not function <laughs> compositions or multiplications. So we have R2, A2 minus R1, A1. All right, so that's A1 prime. And do the same thing right now for A2 prime. You're going to still do in minus out. But of course, we're now taking the perspective of A2. So in and out rates change. So write the uh, in minus out for A2 prime. Actually, the way I wrote this amount, I think that is, this is mass, not concentration. And because of that, so that's why we get a constant amount right here. So the concentration may not be constant, but the amount is constant. That's why we got A1 plus A2 is constant. We have to be a little bit more careful with our uh, derivatives here. So let's look again at A1 prime. So it's really rate multiplied by concentration. So just because I have 10 pounds of salt in my second tank, maybe I have 10 trillion gallons. So 10 pounds of salt and 10 trillion gallons is not very much salt coming in. If I have 10 pounds of salt and 10 gallons, that's a lot of salt coming in right there. So we have to uh, also divide by the uh, volume. So of course we'll go V1 and V2. I think those are good for volumes. So volume one and volume two. So now when we look down here, it should be uh, the inflow for the first tank is the uh, amount divided by the volume, which gives the uh, concentration. Or another way to think about that's the density. I think the units might be off on density, but it's the same thing, density pressure, all this talks about concentration of uh, force over some, I don't know. Yeah, either volume, area, or I don't know, other. It's basically some type of spatial measure uh, you're distributing it across. All right, so we just are dividing these amounts by the volumes.
and then you have a choice. Which I think you have to solve both of them. All right, so let's do an example here and fill in actual values. So the system has 300 pounds of salt. And both rates are 100 gallons per minute. And then we need some, we need to know how much salt is in each tank. So A1, I'm ready to A1 of zero will be zero. So A1 has fresh water at the beginning. And A2, how much salt should A2 have? 300 pounds. 300. So we don't have any leaks in our system, so we should always have 300 pounds of salt. So if A1's got none, A2 has all. And we also know volumes. So we'll say they're both five, 5,000 gallons. Find A1 of T, which is the amount of salt in pounds in tank one at time T. I could just as well ask for the uh, amount of salt in tank two at time t. All right, so the only thing we know right now about the amount of salt is at zero time, there's no salt. So we got a fresh water on the left and salt water on the right. And then we're basically gonna be mixing them. The rates are equal, so the volumes are gonna stay the same. But the amount of salt, there's gonna be lots more salt going from the salt water tank to the fresh water tank. At the beginning, in fact, all, uh, it'll be only salt water going one direction and fresh water going the other, but pretty much instantly, uh, after a very short period of time, there'll be at least some salt going back the other way. Now, there is, you do need to get into a little more fluid dynamics as to, you know, if you look on a very micro level, the salt kind of propagates through like this, so there'll be a few seconds where there won't actually be salt going back through, but uh, this is not fluid dynamics class, so we just assume it happens. It's like a uniform mixing instantly. So when we write this out, the only time it will actually be zero is the initial. Uh, the, the other rate will, uh, will have, rate one will have some salt in it. All right, so let's set this up. We have, I want to know A1, so I'm going to use this A1 prime right here. If I wanted to know the A2 function, I would be doing the A2 prime on the right side. So I'll just rewrite the A1 prime. And I'll write it in English first, in minus out. So our rates are both 100. Uh, 
A2. Now we have to be careful, is uh, A2 changing over time or is it constant? A yeah, A2 is the amount of salt in tank 2, which is going to constantly be decreasing. I shouldn't use that word. It will be decreasing. Um, so it's not going to be constant. So that's why I can't just put 300 in for A2. Uh, 300 is only valid when T is 0. Uh, how about the volume? It should be constant. It should be constant because our rates are equal. And if our rates were unequal, one tank would be increasing and one would be decreasing in volume. So our volume is 5,000. It's in both of them 5,000. Minus our other rates 100 and volume 500 and we get A1. So multiply by 5,000, we have A1 prime. I didn't really talk about what the derivative is with respect to, but what is this derivative with respect to? It's a time derivative. So this is dA1 over dt <coughs> equals, I multiply by 5,000, actually it's multiply by, five, by 50 is a way smarter number. So this is just A2 minus A1. So I want to multiply by dt. I'm just worried we have three variables here. I want to be in two variables. So how in the world can I get a2 I shouldn't have? So I got dA1 and a1. So a2 is the one that would be easier to get rid of. Plus I'm trying to solve for a1 anyway. So it would be really pointless to get rid of it. How in the world am I going to get a2 out of there? So we're going to use that relationship somewhere. I didn't write down here, but I wrote down earlier that we have a constant amount of salt. And we said there was 300 pounds. So now I need A2 gone. So A2 is 300 minus A1. And now we can make that substitution. So A2 is 300 minus A1. A1 all right solve this right now if you don't like the variables it's in I just change it to a xy differential equation where I just let y equal a1 and x equal t. So whatever side you want to solve it on, doesn't matter. Should be pretty easy.
Would it be 50 over that 300 minus 2y dy equals to get? Yeah, I think that's the best way to do it. Yeah, just divide by the entire right side. So I'm bringing this back to A's and T's now. So this capital A on the right is different than the A1. Capital A on the right, just some constant I can fill in with an initial condition. So any questions on getting to this final form? I was very casual with my constants. They changed around, but I didn't really pay much attention to what they changed to. The only important step I'll highlight right here, that A I highlighted is really E to a constant. I just rewrote as A right there. If I had ln of my variable that I'm trying to solve for, then yes. L, the reason this works out is because uh, of that ln. If that ln wasn't there, then no, it would just be basically plus a constant. But when you take a, you know, exponentiate both sides, take the exponential function, that's where addition becomes a product. And that's why instead of a plus c, it's times a constant. All right, what is my initial condition? How do I figure out what a is? A1 of 0 is 0. So I'm going to use that right now. So I highlighted that A1 of 0 is 0. I'm going to use that down here now. So I have A1 of 0 is 150 plus A e to the 0 equals 0. e to the 0 is 1. So A is negative 150. So ready to write this out all the way. A1 is 150 minus 150 E to the negative T over 25.
and you plug in zero, it should be pretty clear you get zero out of this. And you can plug in other T values and get other concentrations at different times. Now if you graph an exponential function with a negative exponent, it basically will look like this right here. We did this way back in pre-calculus one class. This is the basic graph of uh, e to the negative x. This isn't quite e to the negative x, it's e to the negative 125th x or 125th t. The, all that does is going to uh, do a horizontal stretch. Whether it's small or big, it still is going to have this basic shape right here. Uh, will tank one ever actually have 300 pound, or, uh, 150 pounds of salt? Will it ever have half of the salt? Never quite gets the half in this uh, representation right here. It gets very close. At some point, uh, if you count salt by the molecules, you'll be within a molecule. Which I'm not sure about the real life implications of that, but it seems like you'll be off by a molecule at some point. There'll be, there'll be larger variations in the, your measurement than there will be in the difference of salt between the two tanks. Uh, so just because you get this right here, remember things work on, uh, in the real world, a little messier than they, do, than they work out in math. So at some point, you will have, uh, you'll be off by one molecule of salt. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Yes, they, we make a lot of assumptions. So these are all basically just approximations anyways. So you're close enough. Close enough. So there is one more problem that we're going to do, and this is a differential in temperature. And it is also in, uh-oh, I did that thing I always do. This is also in chapter 15, so we're not going to start a new section. I'll just write 15 down below. This may seem completely unrelated, but you'll see very quickly that it's really a lot like uh, thinking about two tanks. This is just a, the concentration is basically heat now. So if you have two different, you have a, a, a body in a room, or it, what do they say, in a medium, a body immersed in a medium, if you're a chemist uh, or a physicist, but basically the body will get closer to the temperature of the medium it's in. So you jump into a freezing ocean, and if you don't have a wetsuit on, your body will slowly change the temperature of the water. Um, well, yes, it does change the temperature of the water a little bit. Uh, but we also assume that there's an infinite amount of water, or an infinite amount of air if you're, you know, you're nice hot coffee sitting in a room, it's not going to stay hot forever, even in this amazing mug. So it's still going to have a difference in temperature. And yes, it will warm the room. Alright, so the rates uh, of change of the temperature of, oh, can I put more ofs in here? rate of change of temperature of a body in a medium whose temperature remains constant So this first rate of change, we're going to use uh, Tb for the temperature of the body divided by dt. So we're using two different Ts. There's temperature of the body, which is Tb. So this uh, constant temperature in the room is Tr, no, Tm. Tm for temperature of the median, medium. What is dTm over d little t? 
it will be zero. So we assumed it was constant. That's different than the temperature of the actual uh, body or object that we're considering. Now, I don't have the name of who wrote this, uh, the scientist who wrote this uh, theorem originally. So it is proportional to their difference. So it's proportional to the difference, T, B minus T M. So if we write the whole differential equation, it's DTB over DT is proportional to, means it's equal to a constant times the difference. And that constant may be positive, may be negative. All right, so this is the differential equation we're going to use here. This is very similar to n minus out that we looked above, or looked at above. We just looked at an amount before. Uh, we didn't necessarily know that there was the same constant multiplied by both, but it's going to be very similar to that last problem that we looked at. So our example, a body is discovered in a basement it could be a you know physics body or a chemistry body mm -hmm. or whatever uh, the room temperature is constant 68 degrees And the body temperature is 72 degrees. Uh, if the body started at 98.6, it's getting a lot more specific. <laughs> oh yeah, it didn't say it's Fahrenheit or Celsius. Uh, if the body at, we'll just do 98, 98 degrees, how long has it cooled in the room? That would be really cold, <laughs> not a basement I'd like to go to. <laughs> how long has it uh, cooled in the room? Well, this is this is this is how long it takes to get to that freezing point. So, it's very different if you put a large volume of water into a fridge or a freezer compared to a small volume of water. It just takes longer, but they both are going to freeze when they reach the same temperature. It's just going to take a lot longer for the large amount of water to reach that temperature. Um, whereas you're probably thinking of like you know salt water versus regular water in terms of what temperature will they act differently. That's a different. That's very different than what we're looking at. We're just looking at the rate of change of temperature. Well, what I was thinking is like you know that the metal has like probably like a, a lower or sorry higher freezing point than like. Yeah, but every I mean, almost every like inanimate object in this room is a solid right now. So we're ab above, or I don't know, I'm not going to talk science stuff, but that's not what we're really talking about. This is how fast things change temperature. And different materials change temperature at different speeds as well. Well, well I was trying to ask, would that mean that you the temperature that gets in the room? Some of these things are still colder or warmer than 
we're assuming that the room's temperature can't be changed. So if you bring 60 people in here and they all come in with like two hot coffees, the room temperature will go up. I mean, unless we have a huge amount of window, you know, cross breeze going or something like that. But uh, we're just focusing on how the object itself is going to change compared to the room that it's in. So you're thinking too much. All right, let's start out by writing our differential equation and what all these mean. So we got dTb divided by d little t equals negative k tb minus tm. So what does tb stand for here? Temperature of the body, which is changing, or variable. What about TM? What does that stand for? Temperature. Yep, temperature of the median, medium or room. And it's constant, so I can just write the number in, which is 68. So I don't need to worry about changing, so we don't really need a variable for it. It's not going to vary. So I'm just going to use 68. If you don't like to keep rewriting TB, let's go ahead and let Y equal TB, and then you can have everything in Ys and Ts. So we use 68 degrees, so that's already accounted for. How do I use 72 and 98? So we're going to use these to get constants. These are initial conditions right here. So let's, let's start with the 98. That's probably easier to think about. How does 98 relate to, well first of all is it TB or TM? It's TB, but TB is not always 98, so I can't just write TB equals 98 forever. So this will be TB of 0 is 98 degrees. So at 0 time, we have 98 degrees um, in the body. What about 72? That's our final. But, do we know what time that occurs? I mean, it occurs when we walk in the room and see this, but... So we don't know T, basically, but we know it's 72, right there. So we're basically going to find little t now. So the last thing we're going to do is use that second condition right there. So last step, we'll plug in these uh, values, but first we need to solve for y, and then get rid of our constant. So this tb of 0 is 98, that's initial condition to find constant. Now this constant I'm referring to is, let's see, there's going to be a k, there's also going to be a constant of integration. What a word, I think we're going to have two constants. All right, let's just take the antiderivative. We can do that at this point. So let's solve for y. We could, uh, the limit of it, if we took the limit, we would say eventually it would hit, so the body would get to 68 degrees. So we could at the end hit it with a limit, and we know that eventually the body temperature will get close to 68 degrees, so the limit would be 68. Which may give us more information about the constant.
So any differential equation question before we get into plugging things in and more algebra? So how do you know why can't you also have like one that Oh, it definitely could. Oh, yeah. But then you do that, you get like, uh, negative So this integral right here. So if you have, well, first of all, you could bring the 1 over k outside, but if you choose to leave it inside, you basically have ky. You, you would need a u sub. So we would have, oh, and then get the k to the other side. So we took care of the Ooh, actually I don't I think it's one over k squared. So DY turns on one over k. That would be one over k squared, ln u plus c. Oops, ky minus sixty-eight k. If I'm doing. Uh, and now I could bring this k. No, I can't. You should come out with the same thing when you mess around with all this stuff. That will just like kind of flow into the constant, basically. It shouldn't, because it's a constant, it shouldn't matter. If that was a y or a t, that would be absolutely critical. Yeah. So constants, you can kind of go either way with them. Just make sure you pay attention and it ends up in the place that it started.